it is interested in protecting itself. That's the reason why I use the word thought is fascist. In its birth, in its uh, essence, in its uh, content, in its action, it is protecting itself all the time. So we are not ready to accept that thought is our enemy. He is. We accept. <laughs> <laughs> I've been having an argument with John about it. <laughs> no, how, how, can, no, no, no. how can anybody accept that it is our enemy? We are what we are. Yeah. Uh, so it does. Yes, it is. That that has helped uh, helped us to be what we are today. So uh, this is the this is the most important uh, uh, question which nobody is interested in asking and getting an answer for that question. It can only create problems. It cannot solve the problem. That is not the instrument. So is there any other instrument when once it is very clear to us. Uh, very clear has no meaning, you know. It can never be clear because every time thought clarifies itself, uh, it strengthens and fortifies the very thing that we are trying to be free from. That is why all insights, however extraordinary they may be, they are strengthening and fortifying the very thing which we are trying to be free from. So all insights are worthless. It is a clarity of thought. No. The clarity of thought is the one that is preventing the possibility of freeing ourselves from that. So you see, there is no way out. Every time you, see, you get a jolt or there is a break, you try to plaster it and make it stronger and stronger. We are not ready. That is what you are. Hmm? What should we do? I mean, how should we be living? <laughs> As I said, you see, how implies you want to know. Mm. Huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you think that the movement of knowledge? It's not a mysterious knowledge that I'm talking about. The knowledge that that is why that you are a man and not a woman. That's a watch. <laughs> that is the knowledge I'm talking about. And uh, if that knowledge comes to an end in you, what you call you, as you know yourself, as you experience yourself, is coming to an end. That's the death. There is no other death. So it is not possible for us to let that go. Why? Why is it possible? You will drop dead. What's wrong with you? You have nothing wrong if you are frightened. Because that's the very thing you don't want to be free from. Fear is all that is there. So, fear is something which you can never touch. Because it's just like if the burning sun there. If you look at the sun, you finish, you are finished, your eyes are gone. That's why the nature is. It's provided us the desire if we close it to protect this living organism. It's not interested in trying to find glasses to look at the burning sun. So whatever is happening is an outburst of energy there, the fear, anger. Hmm? Anger is something which you can never touch. It is something like the, the tide in the ocean. You cannot separate uh, anger from the energy that is there, it's an outburst of energy. All the therapies, so all the techniques we have come up with are only adding momentum to that, giving strength to that. If we don't, you don't want to be free from fear. No? Why not means you will drop dead to try. Don't ask the question, why not? By asking the question, why not, you are making it difficult for whatever is there, the fear or whatever you want to call it, to, to burn itself. The acceptance does not really mean anything. It's just an empty word. So I accept means there is no action there. The fear does not come to an end. What is there is fear. Hmm? Not the fear, the knowledge you have of fear. Hmm? 
the fear is not there, the anger is not there, when you are hopping mad with anger, you will not go to somebody uh, and ask him, how can I be free from anger? <laughs> not at all. It's not there anymore. It's gone. So anything that is happening within the framework of this body cannot be wrong, cannot be false. Unfortunately, the culture says that you should not be angry, that you should be free from anger, this, that, and the other. But what you are dealing with is not anger, but frustration. You have succeeded all your life, for whatever reason, to be free from anger, you have not succeeded. So what you are left with is the frustration. So it's the frustration that is really the problem, not the anger. We attribute, you see, our actions to anger. But actually, why, why should a mother beat a child? Loving child, innocent, delicate child. Because the mother cannot control see, the actions of the child. You don't have the guts to feel that, you see, it is your frustration, it's not anger. And you beat the child and then pick up the child and kiss the child and uh, this is a joke, you see. But we can't deal with any of those things, there is no way you can touch them because thought is dead. It's not something living, it's matter. Hmm? So matter cannot stay in this tremendous energy, it is burning itself out and becoming part of energy. But by demanding to experience the same thing over and over and over again, we are creating this illusory entity. The continuity. Actually there is no continuity there at all. It's all in frames. But the physical body is functioning in frames. It is only the physical body that functions from moment to moment. So the whole talk of, you know, living from moment to moment is a joke. The mind can never live from moment to moment. It's only interested in continuity, it's interested in permanence. <laughs> so is there a mind, first of all, you know? I can say it's a myth, you, see, you and I are created by culture for the main sole purpose of maintaining its continuity. Just the way we have to breathe to survive, you have to use culture to experience yourself as an entity and function sanely and intelligently. And at the same time, the very same culture has created this neurotic situation, wanting two things at the same time. So that is the reason why you maintain neurosis is absolutely essential for survival in this world. Otherwise, you will go crazy. Right? I suppose you couldn't sue somebody for not keeping a promise if it wasn't the same person that you were suing. So they've got, the culture's got to have continuity. It's got to pass its due or are continuous. So the identity, what we, the call, what we call identity, can only be maintained through the constant use of the neurons in the brain, the memory. Yeah. You know? That's the only way. That is why it creates images. It is the physical sensory perceptions cannot create any image. It is the cultural input mm -hmm. that creates these images. So the, as I said before, you see these sensory perceptions are all independent. The sensory activity is independent. It's no different from the camera. I am looking at you and it throws the image on the retina. Mm -hmm. So if I turn this side, the whole thing is wiped out. There is no way I, the eyes can recreate the image that is there on the retina. It must focus it on the object. So even this, what we are told, that uh, the light falls on the object and it uh, activates the optic nerves and throws the image on the retina, this is something which cannot be experienced by you at all, except for the knowledge that is given to us by this physiologist. There is no way you can experience it because it is one unitary movement. Mm -hmm. So sensation and the response to the sensation, I'm talking about the physical response, not reaction. Reaction is, is cultivated, reaction is through the help of thought. Mm -hmm. it, is, it cannot be separated. It is one unitary movement. The moment the thought interferes, it creates a space. Mm -hmm. So in that sense you can say thought is a space. 
And the moment the thought creates the space, there is a demand for time. So you can say thought is a space, thought is a time. Hmm? But space is very essential to survive in this world. Otherwise, there is no way you can function in this world. We have to accept the reality of the world as it is imposed on us. The social world, the huh? cultural world. Cultural world, that is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we will end up in the loony bin singing merry melodies and loony tunes. That is very essential to accept, but when we question the reality, we are in trouble. But you have no way of experiencing the reality of anything except through the help of the knowledge. That is the reason why I am explaining everything in physical and physiological terms. But I, when I say mind is matter, it is not a definition. So you see, you touch this. The sense of touch does not say that this is soft. The sense of touch does not say that this is hard. So only when a space is created through the knowledge I have, you experience this as a soft. The sense of touch does not say that it is hard and this is a soft. So it is the thought that gives substance and materiality to it. And that is the reason why I say thought is matter. Hmm? So, not only this, you translate every sensation within the framework of the knowledge. What is there is only the knowledge. Hmm? So that is the reason we constantly throw this question at ourselves and at others. Because through knowing only this as moment, there is no other way. So when the knowledge comes to an end, that's the end of the story. The part is over. What is left, you will never know. You have no way of experiencing what is there. That is my question. When all these people talk <coughs> of love, bliss, beatitude, immensity, it's nothing but bullshit. Because you have no way of experiencing what you are left with when this moment of knowledge is absent and talk about it. So then it becomes the same storm. You stumbled into something else altogether. I really don't know. This is not in the, the area of the experiencing structure. How it happened, that's the reason why I give the shaft of a lightning hitting you. Yeah. It's a random thing. It's not because I was specially chosen by that or specially trained myself. You don't train yourself to be hit by a lightning. Or you don't step on a live wire. No. By accident, so it is an accident. That is the reason why I say it is a cause. The movement of thought is only interested in one thing, establishing the relationship between cause and effect. You have to find out cause of everything. Otherwise, this has no way of continuing there. So, the statement is made by me that it is a cause of. How can it be a cause of? They are only interested in finding out a cause how it happened to a particular individual and make it happen to everybody. This is something which cannot be produced, you see, on an assembly line. The nature is not interested in using any model. That's what I am emphasizing. Unfortunately, the culture has placed before us the model of a perfect being. That perfect being is the spiritual teacher and his actions, his, act, his behavior patterns. That is where we went wrong. It is just not possible. Huh? You are not going to succeed to fit every human being. Who is unique? This is unique. There is nobody like that anywhere in the world. So we want to fit every human being into a common mold hmm? and produce this kind of a man and humanity. We are not going to succeed. That's the battle that is there. So the value system that culture has placed before us is created because of that model we have before us. That's the reason why I say they are all con. They were mad, manic depressive individuals. All the spiritual teachers, not one single exception. So otherwise there is no need for them to share their petty little experience. <laughs> and they pass it on from generation to generation and we experience the same nonsense and believe that we, we are also is the enlightened people, spiritual people, set up this. 
So this is not an experience. What hit this individual, if I put it that way, is that there is no such thing as a new experience at all. It drives you, you almost flip. <laughs> the line of demarcation between <laughs> a madman and me is very, very thin. Very thin. It drives you crazy. Really. So, if you pose this question, this, this was my question. <laughs> is there anything I want other than <clears throat> what culture or what others wanted me to want? Is there any? thought I have which I can call my own? Huh? Is there any way of thinking, any other way other than they ever wanted me to think? It never occurred to me for a long time, this want, not to want what others wanted me, also I want. Hmm? So that is the reason why I maintain, wanting is thinking, it doesn't matter what you want. You begin to think. So the thinking is possible only when you rely upon somebody else's ideations and meditation. There is no way. So that is the reason why I don't have any thoughts of my own. Not one thought which I can call my own. Hmm? We always pick up those things, make it ours, from the common fool. When I use the word common fool, I, I don't mean union. <laughs> not at all, not, not at all. It is passed on to the couple of generation to generation. My grandmother told me that the sky is not blue anyway, it's cloudy. Even that, somebody told me. I told you one uh, Texan scientist uh, visited me. He said, now I know why the sky is blue. What the hell you are talking about? The grandmother told me the sky is blue. Every time I look at the blue sky, I said to myself, why do I have to tell myself all the time? that the sky is free, nobody is asking me. Why do I tell myself? Why do I tell myself all the time that the table, white table? This is what I am talking about. If that is not, if that moment is not there, that's the end of you. So you have, that is the only identity. There is no other identity. If that comes to an end, the whole thing is finished. The knowledge that that is a table, that's, it, see, it sounds very simple, but the crux of the problem is that. So you always tell yourself, if you are not telling anything about the world around you, I am not happy, I am bored, I am not enlightened, I am alive, I am not dead. Why do we have to tell ourselves constantly huh, that I am this, I am not that, that I am bored, that I am angry, that I am happy, that I am not happy? Hmm? People ask me, are you not bored? How can I be bored? I don't find anything more interesting, more meaningful, more purposeful to do than what I am doing in that given situation, that's all. So I can't be bored. And that can be anything at all. From frame to frame, from frame. just the way this is functioning the body. Huh? Say when you eat breakfast, how do you eat breakfast? Differently from me. No, same thing I eat. I don't tell myself that I'm eating breakfast. <laughs> I'm eating porridge. Well, these cornflakes are very good. No. <laughs> <laughs> the more preservatives they have in the food, the greater is the chance of preserving this body. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we'll be able to use all the the cream you brought down. <laughs> that's no. that's a battalion we have there. Yeah. <laughs> too much for me. Well, you see, we can't eat the cream because we don't think it's healthy. <laughs> you are told by the nutritionists. They are called for a, a bunch of cholesterol. We'll get cholesterol. No, so no, the fat is fat. You try it. So the full cream will have to be thrown away. Okay. <laughs> I am looking for 80%, 90% of the cheese that comes from Tasmania. It has 90%, 80%. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the brie made in Tasmania has <laughs> a lot of fat. How That's the reason why I come to Australia. Australia. <laughs> you don't get that kind of stuff in France. Come up there and breathe. It's uh, the high content of 
fat, you don't get it there. Yeah. How does your body exist on the very small amount that you eat, and very bad for you cream sandwiches and things like that? <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't body... eat cream sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> you would have eaten something new, huh? <laughs> you would have eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and the body needs very little. But you don't, you don't eat greens, not much. I don't eat. For a vegetarian, I don't eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> but how does your body... Um, they survived 72 years. What's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> but you may just think that we should do the same. I do the same. No, but we perhaps should... Imitate you. No, 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 you can't imitate you. You're miserable. Don't try that. <laughs> 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 if, if, variety, that's what I always say. if you want to eat varieties of food, why not have varieties of girls? This is a source of fun. Okay? But we are not ready to accept that. I'm not uh, advocating one or the other. But when once, you see, it becomes uh, a pleasure movement. Then only it creates the problems. I'm not saying anything against pleasure. Yes. God is the ultimate pleasure. Uh, liberation, moksha, freedom. All that is the ultimate pleasure. We are not ready to accept that. And there is no way that this body can take the sensation of pleasure for long. This is what I'm saying. The request for happiness is a lost battle. The holy man can sell you any technique, any gimmick, and tell you that you can be in an eternal uh, bliss, eternal happiness. It's not going to work because he knows every sensation has a limited life of its own. The span of life is very limited. The moment you capture that within the framework of your experiencing structure and say that it is a pleasurable sensation, the demand to keep it lasts longer goes <coughs> That is the conflict, that's the fight that is going on here. So it is rejecting all sensations. The body does not know what pleasure is. Hmm? Oh, pain? Pain also, if you don't translate, it is a series of sensations of pain. By linking them all together and create a continuity, the so-called physical pain becomes more acute than what actually it is. That's all that is there. The psychological pain does not exist. The psychological pain is created by our thinking, achieving certain goals. Is there a pleasure apart from psychological pleasure? Cultural input. Right, you just said there's a pain apart from psychological pain. The physical pain you call it. Yes. But I am not for a moment suggesting that you should endure pain, prove to yourself that you can endure pain, either for spiritual reasons or any other reason. There is no point. If there is some way you can be rid of the pain, by all means try it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, what do we do? I am not for a moment suggesting that you should bear the physical pain, or live with pain. It's very easy to say live with cancer, but it is. Oh boy, you should see people suffering from cancer. Hmm? Groaning with pain, even saints. I tell you. All of the saints and sinners go exactly the same way. Yes, there's a sort the of myth that they don't, isn't there? Huh? There's a myth that they don't feel that. That they pain. don't, yes. Now it has become fashionable. The cancer is a fashionable disease for all the saints <laughs> in our midst. Huh? I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ramakrishna. No, Krishna Murthy died of cancer, yes. and Ramana Maharshi died of cancer, yes. and that man there in Bombay who wrote that book, <laughs> yes, sir, no, the died of cancer. That's why I'm asking my friends, should I die of any other disease? See that my birth death certificate carries because of my death cancer, otherwise yes, uh, I would not be recognized by posterity. <laughs> 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 not that I want people to recognize me as a religious teacher. That's the one thing I don't want. <laughs> you said the body doesn't um, feel pleasure. What about sex? 
<laughs> sexual please. You see, that's also part of the pleasure moment. It is a simple biological function. It has become possible for the human, if I may use that word, to have sex at any time we want, only through the help of thought. So when once you turn that into a pleasure moment, we have created a problem there. I am not saying anything against uh, pleasure. As far as I am concerned, denial of sex for any reason, for spiritual reason, or indulgence in sex, is totally unrelated to their spiritual pursuit. That's all that I am saying. You know, it is it's a biological it's a sex. You see, in, in a uh, situation like this, the whole hormones have undergone a very strange, strange uh, this, this, this is an abnormal person. This is an abnormal situation. And this cannot be a model for the rest of mankind. That's where we went wrong. They did not know why they could not have sex, those people. Assuming for a moment they were all enlightened people. And uh, so the whole body undergoes a chemical change. See, that means the nature has thrown this out. It has no use for nature anymore. That's why when I meet some of those people, pontiffs in India, who practice celibacy, they say, you are all committing a crime against nature. <laughs> what are you doing? Why it has become a very important factor in all spiritual life is because they could not, the teachers could not have sex. For this reason, <laughs> you know, not because of any other reason. The whole body undergoes a sort of a chemical change. From the nature's point of view, it has no use for this at all. The living organism has only two things. One, survival, and the other thing to reproduce. It's not interested in anything else. <laughs> what are you doing? Why it has become a very important factor in all spiritual life is because they could not, the teachers could not have sex. For this reason, <laughs> you know, not because of any other reason, the whole body undergoes a sort of a chemical change. From the nature's point of view, it has no use for this at all. The living organism has only two things. One, survival, and the other thing to reproduce one. It's not interested in anything else. So all the cultural input there is the enemy of this living organism. That's the conflict, that's the battle that is going on. So there is no way we can free ourselves from that. How can we free ourselves from that? What you call you is that. Hmm? So when that comes to an end, the death takes place, you see. So a sort of a clinical death took place in the case of this individual. What is left after that? I have no way of knowing it. I have no way of telling myself that I am alive and not dead. If you ask me the question, are you alive or dead? My answer would be, yes, I am alive. Because the question is born out of the knowledge you have of how a living individual functions operates. You see? So the that knowledge brings the answer, I am alive, I would never say I am dead. But the fact that this is a living being can never, never be experienced by, by me. The body has no way of experiencing its age, has no way of experiencing that it is alive or dead for all practical purposes. For all purposes, death does not exist for this. But all you find there was there in that single cell there. The whole blueprint was there. If you mess it up, probably it will not bloom into a human being like this, a genius like you. Since they are perished. If we don't mess it up by eating health food, and in that in religious activity, it can grow into a human being. In the West, you see, a lot of people have come to the conclusion or the feeling that um, ordinary sex, the way it's being practiced, is not the way to go. It's kind of too rough. So now they're doing a kind of tantric sex with a different kind of orgasm, much gentler and slower. Yeah, it's about the same. 
They still want to make a business. So, <laughs> you know, what is so tantric about? So when I heard uh, this tantric center there, uh, Rajinesh center, I said, it's a fucking club site. <laughs> if somebody asked me a question, what of love? I said, love is a four-letter word, misspelled. <laughs> Why call it is tantric sex? What is so marvelous about it? The whole tantric business came in, in, in India as a reaction against the you know, suppression of sex for spiritual reasons. They went too far. That's why you have all these temples and sex symbols. Every temple has all kinds of imaginable sex postures you have there. And uh, so they they translate all that and give some mystical explanation to that kind of thing. What is so mystical about it? I'm sorry. The people are trying to get cosmic orgasms now. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what is so cosmic about it? <laughs> there is a good market for that kind of thing. Yeah, very good. good luck to them. <laughs> <coughs> You can have a weekend, I think, for a thousand dollars. Here in Sydney, I think you can have a touch you with your friends. Yeah. Thousand dollars, yeah. boy, that's something. <laughs> I haven't got a thousand dollars, so I shall never know. <laughs> <laughs> so you would say the choice was to die or to live naturally? You drop all definitions of life and death. Then it takes care of it. Just a death function. That's what uh, I'm trying to get across. Death can never, never be an experience. How can it be an experience? But that experience changes the whole thing, your know, way of looking at things, way of experiencing things. It's some sort of a mystical experience. So, but still, you see, the dependence on some authority is still there. It's an extraordinary experience, like any other experience. It changes your whole way of thinking, your whole way of looking at things, whole way of experiencing things. You know? This thing is something. No, oh. this is the end. Mm. There is no experience yes. of any kind. kind. So that's the reason why I say death can never be experienced. Yes. Because it cannot experience the fact that it is living. You are not going to preside over your own death, and that is for sure. So why this body is still continuing is because it has the capacity to renew itself. But when we reach our 90th year or 100th year and die there, the body has no way of uh, renewing itself. So death and birth and death is a simultaneous process. It is happening all the time. Every time the thought is born, you are born. And through that artificial maintenance of the continuity of thought, we think we are living all the time. So isn't that the aim of, uh, of much meditation in search of enlightenment? Search of to cease thought, to be out of thought. No, not at all. You can't uh, get out of thought through the use of thought. How can you? By ceasing to think. What for? We want to die. <laughs> and they don't want to die. They but want to live in a spiritual state. To be in a void. As the Buddha would speak, the poor boy. I don't know what he meant, uh, void. How can, how can you experience void? Well, maybe you can experience Then you don't talk of void. Yeah. What I have against Buddha, they don't like it. Yeah. For the first time in the history of human thought, he introduced the element of hospitalization, converting people. He created a sangha, he created an organization created a tremendous following in that family. Before that, there was no such thing as conversion at all. Those sages just talked about those things and just did it. This fellow, for the first time in the history of mankind, created that mystery. And after that, everybody else, Jesus, Muhammad, started the same thing. Conversion is never part of that. In the course of all your travels, have you come across any other individual who it seems remotely to have undergone a similar problem. Obviously it's not the same. First of all, he wouldn't come to me to, to verify whether he is in the same state. You might meet him on a train or something. <laughs> if you ask me any questions, I would know them. I would know them. <laughs> That's all. 
he won't ask any. We met Nisarga uh, Dutta and I, uh, the fellow who edited that book, his book. He mm-hmm. was a very close friend of mine. Lord Sri. Lord Sri. He was a very close friend. And uh, he used to meet me and uh, then he was with Ramana Maharshi for a long time and then uh, with Krishna Maharshi. And he met me quite a few times and then he got involved with uh, with Nisarga Krishna. Because he who put all those things together. So actually it it was not his statement. It it was a a mixture of so many things, Krishna Maharshi and Lingo, Ramana Maharshi stuff all put together, you know. But anyway, one day he telephoned me, asking me to visit the woman he was they were living together in the same house, the old lady. I was leaving the next day to Switzerland. He said, I would like, to, she would like to see you. She cannot climb the, the steps and I was living on the fourth floor. It was very difficult path. And I said, I would uh, visit her. I went there and there was this man sitting there. So he asked some questions. I answered in my own way. He asked him some questions. He answered them in Marathi. I did not understand. He didn't understand the English. So there was somebody there translating. And the whole thing. He knew neither Marathi nor English well enough to make any sense out of that. That's all. And in the end, this moderator, Krishna asked me the question, what do you think of that man? I said, I don't know what he said. I met a man and then walked out. And I don't know what he said about me, but he has uh, said a lot about me in that book. Uh, he asked him questions about me. He said, Maharaj, in one of those books. Yes, 71 or some chapter. He said, he said that I would stop talking, I would practice silence. <laughs> so far, <laughs> no way I can stop talking. You say enlightenment is, is bunk, but was there not something about this man? I mean, everybody thought he was enlightened. We think, enlightened. I we don't think, think I don't think they, there is no way you can tell you a, that you are an enlightened man, that you are a free man. Somehow, yeah, I don't know. Not, I felt is not the word. I thought not the word. I don't know. Let's not bother about the right word. There is nothing there to explain. Not even for the physical uh, needs of the world. You know, there is no such thing as hunger for me. But from time to time, I put some food. What is called? Because the body needs energy. Otherwise, I can't go and enjoy it. I have to live a civilized life in the midst of all these civilized They can't go back and live a dog or a cow or an animal. So that's all the body needs is some energy. If you don't eat after two, three years, it doesn't demand food. It eats on itself. Sixty-three days you can survive and then it goes. You know those fellows, the terrorists who fasted into death there in Ireland, they talked about the peculiar experiences that they had because they fasted for 63 days. They said the body can survive without food for 63 days or 62 days and without water for 72 hours. So they talked about the strange things that they were experiencing. All of them could be fitted into religious experiences the saints talked about. Or is the breathing exercise. Right? Cutting out the flow of oxygen into your brain, you can experience all kinds of things. And you can call them spiritual experience. If you raise the blood pressure, you feel as if you are levitating, hitting the field. So the levitation is one of the gimmicks that this cancer levitation man is selling. Everywhere. There was a, an advertisement in the Time magazine inviting all the governments <laughs> to create a what kind of a world on this planet, I don't know. So you see, by increasing through these gimmicks, the blood pressure, you experience as if you are levitating, you are hitting the, the ceiling here. These are all the gimmicks that uh, they experienced and taught the people. The meditation is a war, battle that is going on there. 
That's why I call it evil. The moment you sit to meditate, only the evil thoughts enter. Okay? You want to replace them with beautiful spiritual thoughts. There is a battle going on there. It is a vast battle. And you are tired. The peace you experience is the peace between the two walls. And then you, see you want to do that again and again. Because it's pleasure. Mm. It's pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Yuki, you said uh, there's nothing to understand, but we need to understand that there is nothing to understand. How are you going to perform that miracle? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you are helping us, aren't you? No, no. in as much as... No, 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 no. You're getting us to look. No, no, you say that. So you are already repeating what I said. It has already become part of your knowledge. Yes. So there the is phrase, the ending. The phrase. Uh, uh, that's all we know. All words, phrases, and people. So the moment it becomes part of your knowledge, yes, huh? it has to become part of the knowledge. You know that book, Freedom from the Known. That is the very thing you have to be free from. How can you be free from when you are brainwashed to believe that you have to be free from the tradition? Go on, finish. So the very thing that the man is, the very thing that I am saying, that's the thing you have to be free from. Because it has already become part of the know. That is nature. The only way it can survive, maintain its continuity, or the momentum, is through making whatever I am saying part of that. Mm-hmm. So we just repeat those words. I'm not blaming you. That's all that no. we can do. No. Hmm? no. So that is not the instrument. That's all that I am saying. That can only create problems. It cannot solve the problem. So we have tremendous investment in that instrument because that is the one that has helped us to be what we are and to create this world comfortable around us and to survive longer than the other species on this planet. So how can you let go of that? It's foolish to let go of that. True. Sounds rather a good thing. To let that go. There is no way you can let it go. That's a problem. <laughs> to, to be in a thoughtless state, it has invented. Huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I know many people come and tell me, yes, I was in a thoughtless, what the hell you are talking? How can you say that you were in a thoughtless mm-hmm. state? The thought was very much there. Timeless state. There is no such thing as a timeless state. It is the time that has created the timeless state. It is the thought that has invented the thoughtless state and trying to put itself into that thoughtless state. In this process, it is gathering some peculiar kinds of experiences and those experiences give you hope one day that you are going to be in a thoughtless state. What for? Hmm? Whatever you are doing to free yourself from thought is a, that is, is a thought. That is why I am saying the thoughts are not self-generated. They are not spontaneous. They come from outside. We use them to translate these sensory perceptions to maintain that identity. We use them. And something else seems to be happening with you. You seem to be doing something different. You said in that, in that movie with you, you gave me, there was a very interesting thing that the chat picked on. And, uh, you said that when you look at the clock, you're just looking at the clock, and it's not a clock, it's just, you know, you know it's just something, uh, which you can't so put yes, words yeah, to. And then mean, suddenly, when anybody asks you the time, yes, yes, it, it, all that thing called knowledge it, comes out, it, and you say it's quarter past three. It, it's computer that is there. Yeah. Yes. Now, so it seems to me that... No, you see, you are looking at the television, for yes. example. Yes. And you are creating all that is not there, they are all dots. Sure, yes. See? So you create yes. the pictures there. Yes. It's yes. your problem. Yes. There are all dots there on the yes. television. Yes. Huh? You are not listening. There is a gap between these sounds there. See, these notes are different. What is language after all? Huh? Spacing the two different notes and the tune. So it, it becomes English, Latin, Greek, or uh, any of those uh, oh, 16 Indian languages. Why on the dialect? It's the music is also that the space between the two notes. Mm-hmm. And the melody. That is music. And what is beauty? Beauty is a frame. If there is no frame, you don't talk of immensity there. Without a frame, there is no beauty there. That's cultural. Huh? Sure. 
What seems to happen what? with that put it in front of you. Well, what seems to happen when, with you is that um, there is something, we don't know what, uh, you have the words that you can't, something happening, and then when somebody says to you, what's the time? Suddenly, all this cultural knowledge that's necessary to say it's a quarter past three arrives. You say it's a quarter past three, it goes away again. Remember, he then did Yeah, that's it. And then if I say, what color is the clock, you say yellow. We have a girl looking after this old lady in India, Bangalore. She doesn't know how to read the time, Mm. but she didn't go to school. We were taught how to read the time there, the clock. Otherwise, we have no way. We just look at it. Not that I am ignorant. The, all the information is there. You see, it is stripped of all the ima- Meaning, yes, images. Yes, yes. The image building structure is thrown out of them because of this Holocaust. <laughs> it's very interesting that, that, that you said the television analogy. I told you that um, uh, they, they snatched me back from four hours when I was supposed to be dead. I don't know if I was. But ever since then, two things have happened which sound remarkably like what you've said, but that's slightly different. But then, of course, they would be because I'm not the same. But when I watch the television set, it suddenly disappears into dots. Uh, and then I had to recreate the picture myself. And when I listen to music now, I hear individual notes and I hear individual instruments. But I suddenly find it all comes back again. If I think, oh, I want to listen to the music, it all comes back. I also have my music sometimes, but I have a great difficulty to enjoy the Western music. <laughs> you know, I was brought up there in India. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony doesn't make any sense to me, but, you know. And now, having lived so many years outside India, I can tolerate it. <laughs> not enjoy it. <laughs> it sounds a difficult way to live. No, it's very simple to live. Uh-huh. No, it sounds it's automatically. Not functional oh, at all. Thought is functional. It ceases to be the instrument of achieving, uh, accomplishing, attaining anything. So the energy that uh, is consumed with this. Uh, constant demand to maintain the identity. That's why you dream, I don't dream, uh, you know. So the, the images continue. You are not actually dreaming, I don't sleep in that sense, you know, like a cat. Uh, sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up, wake up, you see like that. It's, there's no uh, continuity there. So there's no way I can dream. The images don't exist even while I'm awake. So how can I dream when I am? You are forced. Um, by the demands of the body to rest. It, this demands, so I don't have to do anything while I'm sitting here. Uh, the cuts, the sensory, it slows down. The sensory activity slows down. The eyes may be open, it sees nothing. It's just for a fraction of a thing. And then after that it becomes clear. That is the clarity I'm talking about, not the clarity of thought. By repetitive process, our thoughts become very clear, and that's what we are interested in, the clarity of thought. But here, the clarity of the sensory perceptions, extraordinary clarity it has. You see, not that uh, I can count every hair you have on your head, it sees the space between the two hairs. Uh-huh. You know, through the help of a computer, probably it will be possible to prove that I'm wrong if I give hazard a uh, figure and say that you have so many hairs. Uh-huh. It's not in that sense. You see, that's the clarity. Hmm? If this is a tremendous uh, organ, whoever created, there may not be any creator, it may have just happened in that way. Tremendous intelligence is there. Huh? But are you saying that there isn't a road? A road doesn't exist until the time comes for you to have to cross it. That even there, I cannot tell you, visualize, supposing somebody asks me how to get to great premise there. I cannot visualize the whole thing, probably you can. I can take you there like a dog. I have a dog sense in the sense. Or, without creating any images, I can tell you go there. It's only a word. It's a word picture. You know? Then turn left, there is a door. Open the door. Turn right, there is an elevator. Nothing is there inside. I'm giving you a word picture. Go down and then walk. take a few steps, turn right and then turn left and go through that, you see the, the arcade there, and you take the elevator and you get onto the George Street, you take a few steps there, this great person is there. Now, what's this it's different? Route, step by step, step by step, from <coughs> one point to another. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see. Now, what's this different for you before your calamity? I don't know how it works because I cannot say that this is the way it is functioning. 
and it was different before. There is no before and after wash. Uh -huh. So yeah. we hear of the collapse. We don't know that. No, I know. To me, you see, that is whatever I did, whatever I did not do. See, all the events up to the point of lifting the It's like any other event. So this event can never be fitted into a value system anymore. It has no value for me. I cannot set up a holy business. I cannot thrive on the gullibility and credulity of the people if I don't have any way of surviving. Probably I have become a French digger there or a grave digger. I don't know. If such a situation arises because I don't have any tools. <laughs> you have mentioned the importance of the fact that you came to one basic question and you were left with that until it exploded. It's like an atomic explosion. You thought one thought. Because that almost sounds like a method to me. You know, so we should all go around looking for our basic questions. Now I say you don't have any questions there. <laughs> oh no, in the sense that all the questions which you have are the variations of the same question, number one. It didn't occur to me, you yes. know. So the question is born out of the answers you already have. Otherwise there are no questions at all. So supposing there is an answer for that question, the question should go, but the question transform continues. That means you are not ready to let go the answer you have. The answer is not the answer for that question. All right, if you are ready to let go the answer, the teacher who has given that answer assured you that that is the answer goes with the answer. So the sentiment comes into the picture. So if you brush aside the answer, you also brush aside the teacher, for which you are not ready. So both of them go. If the teaching does not help you to understand anything, the teaching goes and the teacher goes along. Not one teacher. So that is the reason why I say I have not learned anything from any teacher, either secular or spiritual teacher. It's not that I am very proud. I don't find myself that is uh, superior to all the other teachers, and not in that sense. They all conned themselves and conned me too. I am not ready to con myself. If you like to con yourself, it's, it's your tragedy and it is their privilege. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> you say that... Not a problem. <laughs> You say that before the calamity, which we're going to tell you about afterwards, um, you did experience all sorts of states like samadhi... I knew that they were all thought-induced experiences. This can't be. What do you mean by that? This is not what I'm interested in. I'm still there. There's somebody who is experiencing this thing. You mean people when they... The fact that <coughs> I experience and tell myself that I'm in a blissful state, means that I have the knowledge of the blissful state. I may experience such extraordinary experiences for the first time, the fact that I recognize that hmm? as a blissful state means that the knowledge is there, the knowledge of the blissful state is there. That is the reason why I say, if there is any enlightened man, he can never tell himself that he is an enlightened man. He cannot tell himself that he is a free man. So how can I go around the world freeing people? I am not freeing people. I am not interested in freeing anybody. I am telling you, this is what uh, I have found. If you want to listen, listen. If you don't want, uh, it's of no interest to me. You know, people are, uh, ask me the question, why are you talking? Uh, well, why not? You, see, you, you are here, so I am talking. Why are you breathing? Why are you traveling? You see, I have traveled all my life. You see, I have no home. <laughs> That's why I said, I'm a man with roof, he said, I won't have no tangible means of livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> Something like Jesus. <laughs> no, I don't know about Jesus. No, it goes a bit older.